right, Janice, you're on. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are around the world. First, I want to acknowledge that this is World Unity Week, and it has been an extraordinary week with incredible offerings from visionaries and change agents and people with great heart, great vision, and uh, incredible experience. Each day has a theme that's nature-driven, and today is Climate Day. And what exactly is climate, okay? Uh, it's not a cold winter where you can throw a snowball across Congress and say there's no such thing as climate change. The short-term atmospheric conditions are what we call weather, and these are the daily, hourly, monthly data we collect. The long-term atmospheric conditions are what we call climate. And these are short-term weather conditions averaged over long periods. So weather is short-term climate and climate is long-term weather. My first eco hero as a child was Jacques Cousteau. And he famously said, people protect what they love. They love what they understand and they understand what they are taught. So after working with environmental issues most of my life, and climate change since I first discovered it at the Rio Summit in 1992, I realized over and over that Cousteau was right. Thus, my work in helping to translate science into consumer speak, maybe it's my love of science paired with my marketing background, but it's a passion I pursue. And I am very, very, I know everybody says I'm very blessed to work with, but, you know, we have to count our blessings. And I met Carrie uh, through a Chip Cummins, who you all, uh, many of you know, at the American Renewable Energy Institute, which I've worked with for many years. And Carrie Kepping and Andrea Spar, <coughs> Andre, excuse me, are the directors of Arctic Arts Project. And they've managed to achieve something that most storytellers don't. They attain a level of visual literacy with their work that touches the heart and speaks to both scientists and the world at large. So Arctic Arts has been focused on high-level collaborative science with organizations around the world who consistently acknowledge that we are instrumental in helping them gain understanding and visual truth to what they only see in modeling and data points. So we're going to give you an example of runaway climate chaos in real time. So first, I'll introduce Carrie Kepping, who is an internationally acclaimed environmental photographer, visionary, and communicator dedicated to the stewardship of the environment and the Arctic. He's the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Arctic Arts Project. He is dedicated to global sustainability by illuminating climate issues through the use of, use of science and visual literacy. His work's been published in prestigious media channels throughout the world, including Smithsonian National Center for Atmospheric Research and CAR, Eco National Academy of Science, Eco and the National Academy of Science, excuse me, AMAP, Arctic Today, many more, the Arctic Council, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. And then Andrea Sparrow is the executive producer for the Arctic Arts Project. She's an award-winning photographer, a filmmaker, and a writer. Andrea has paid close attention to the impact of humanity on the natural systems of our world for more than 30 years. She's passionate about communicating the science behind our changing climate and the strategies we need to mitigate our impact and adapt to the world. And I will add that Andrea is a mother as well. And so she is passionate about being a very good ancestor to generations to come. And Bruce Vaughn is a climate scientist and a fellow at the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado. He analyzes climate history from polar ice cores to Greenland to Antarctica. His lab also measures weekly samples of greenhouse gases from over 60 NOAA sites. That's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Those sites scattered around the world. He has been going to Greenland since the 1980s and has personally witnessed unprecedented climate change firsthand. And he also rides a bike. So uh, without, so we really are here to share not only their work, but this is since there's been 
a nature theme every day. This is, they've captured nature speaking. So without further ado, I think Carrie, you'll begin here. If we could spotlight Carrie. Hello. Hello. Janice, thanks for the introduction. Um, we're really honored and, uh, okay. and we're honored and uh, excited Carrie. to be here to share with you some of our visions of what we've been working on for the last decade plus at Arctic Arts Project. And one of the things that drives us um, is this very kinetic change that we witness on an ongoing basis. It, and this, the title of the, the seminar today is Runaway Climate Change, Climate Chaos. And over the last decade, what we have seen is relevant changes happening at an increasing pace. And so what we wanna to do today is just kind of bring together the visuals that we've been working on. And uh, we're excited to have Bruce with us. Bruce has been a partner with us for a few years and uh, he brings a scientific component to our work. And uh, we just wanna share with you some of the great things that we're doing. Climate chaos right now is maybe the biggest environmental threat that humanity has ever faced. And nowhere on the planet is it more endangered than the Arctic. The Arctic has become a sentinel for relevant changes seen throughout the world. And we work with individuals, science communities, individual communities, businesses, and policymakers around the world to inspire, to educate, and to promote action surrounding climate change. We have coined the phrase visual literacy and that Janet touched on a moment ago. And what does that mean? Well, we're living in a world where there's more people with cell phones than there are people on this earth that have access to running water. And with that becomes one, a responsibility, but a channel for really good education because through the visual that everybody has a cell phone, we're able to impart a knowledge that through our work, through our visuals, what climate change looks like, what does climate chaos look like, as well as the stories of change and empathy for places and people. Um, one of the things that we find that's really missing around the world is empathy and compassion for those that are underspoken, underrepresented. And through our work, we're giving uh, really a, a visual representation of what we can do as humans to connect with one another through science-based data and the truth therein. So we, we bring together this visual literacy through award-winning film, and we're trying to bring this environment of the Arctic to life and then connect people to the relevance of what that looks like. You know, it, it's so hard when people living in Miami are saying, I, I don't live anywhere near the Arctic. How is it relevant to me? And yet we see constant increase in hurricanes. We see constant increase in uh, drought in the Southwest. We see constant heat indexes exceeding things in the Indian region. How are we making those relevant to what's going on in the Arctic? So that's what we try and bring is that relevance from understanding the tiniest, tiniest aspects of the Arctic through macro photography and our aerial image all the way to sweeping videos of wildlife and the science of those specific environmental or ecosystems that we can bring to the viewer. So what we're talking about in terms of the Arctic and relevance <clears throat> is a, a chance for us as a team uh, to bring awareness through credible sources. And so we're excited to share a little bit about who we are today. Um, and I wanna just kind of introduce Bruce and you know, Bruce again has been working with us as um, the science component, the backbone of who we are. And Andrea, do you have the slide of the science? 
Oh, it looks like we're gonna have to unmute. So I just wanted to show what Andrea is pulling up. Um, these are just some of the science organizations that we collaborate with to bring in an understanding of different ecosystems, different science elements around the world. And then we pool it together with how we're going to present our visuals. And so you can see Andrea and I are both uh, research affiliates with the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado, uh, where Bruce is a fellow. And um, just kind of give you an idea of the, the diverse background science-wise that we bring to our visuals. So anyways, Bruce, um, the, the Arctic is changing quickly. And uh, obviously you're no, um, Corner to that subject. Why don't you tell us a little bit about everything of, in your firsthand witnesses of how the Arctic is changing. Um, maybe give us some metaphors for people to understand why science is not a black and white element. And we'll go from there. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Kerry. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. And um, I hope that we can leave our listeners and viewers with some uh, really much greater understanding of Greenland and the Arctic and why it matters to them. Why should you care? Um, I think uh, we have done uh, an amazing job trying to understand our climate over the last decades that I've been involved with it, but uh, we've come really short in terms of communicating that to, to the general public. And I'm here to say that scientists need artists. Um, we you guys are so much better at communicating the visual impact of what we're doing than we are. But um, as I've said before, humans are inherently visual beings and the power of, of the Arctic arts and this sort of mission that we're on is really couldn't come in a more critical time. Um, we, cause we desperately need tools to convey the urgency of this climate crisis. And uh, that one of the best ways I know of to do that was the stunning images coupled and backed by fact-based science. And so we need to appear to our intellects, but we also need to uh, appeal to our souls. Because uh, what, we, what we need right now is to come together and to face one of the greatest challenges as a species we, we have ever faced. And um, I feel very fortunate to have chosen a field of work that three decades ago was sort of a little bit more obscure than it is today that has come into the limelight over the last couple of decades. And uh, much of my work in Greenland has been focused around understanding climate through climate history as revealed in ice cores. Uh, there are wonderful um, time capsule of uh, history of climate. We can go back hundreds of thousands of years. And if you believe that we're trying to save the earth by trying to understand it, it, it gives us confidence in our ability to forecast future behavior of the planet and the sort of dynamics of the climate by understanding what's happened in the past. And three decades ago, we taught that climate occurs on generational timescales, uh, not very rapid. And one of the biggest take home lessons we learned way back in the early nineties with the GIFS II ice core is that, holy moly, climate can change really rapidly. We're having discussions now about 1.5, 2 degrees, 3 degrees over the next 100 years. We have evidence in the ice core record that 11,000 years ago, we had changes of 6 and 7 degrees Celsius within a decade. This is like within the term of a congressman, you can change climate status. And so um, this was a really big take home message that things can happen really quickly. Um, another big lesson is that climate is not linear. Uh, there's lots of nonlinear feedbacks to systems. So what do I mean by that? It means that you can go along perturbing the climate, sort of pushing on it, pushing on it, nothing happens and all of a sudden something happens. And there's lots of little hidden feedback loops that we'll talk more about later. But think of science as not sort of a static thing of what we know in terms of concrete terms, but rather I like to think of it as a chalkboard that extends over the horizon. We're writing with one hand, we're erasing with the other because our, our context, our knowledge base is constantly changing and giving us new perspectives on where we are. So uh, we'll get more into this later, but um, why do you care about Greenland? Um, there's enough ice in Greenland, if it was all gone, to raise sea level by about 24 feet. Think about Venice, think about Miami Beach, some of the countries in the Pacific, 
they just simply wouldn't be there. So um, is this going to happen on short time scales? No, this takes hundreds of years to do this. But uh, I liken this to uh, a student with a term paper that's due and it's a week before finals and we don't even have an outline. So um, of all the, all, all the countries um, and the, the, the uh, businesses that have signed on to making agreements for a net carbon zero future, um, very few, if any, actually have a plan to do that. So we understand it, we get the problem, it's real, it's happening, it's us, but we need a plan. And so what to do actually makes a lot of the science that I do look like child's play because it involves human behavior and that's very unpredictable, but there's never been a time more urgent for us to come together. And I hope that today we can kind of explore some of those and see some amazing imagery that the Arctic Arts people have for you that will bring this message home to you much better than I can. So thanks, Bruce. Um, so how do we translate the science into the visuals? Um, our team puts together conversations through scientific papers, through uh, just a heads up by a science organization that says, hey, this is happening, be aware. And uh, we've done everything from permafrost studies to meta studies within Greenland to where there's change that's happening. But we also take a look at things from visual artist communicators standpoint and say, does this belong? What's, what's going on here? Because we may visually see something that the science world has only modeled through data points. They don't have the visuals to go with it. So we as artists will bring it to light in a way that uh, really imparts education to the scientific world. Uh, so we kind of do it both ways and we try and do it in a very quick manner, meaning uh, we hear about a study and we're off and we get on the ground and make compelling visual documentation and put together some shorts and uh, communicate it out to both the education, scientific world and the public at large. So um, we wanna show you a, a film and Andre is gonna introduce it. This was done a few years ago, but it'll give you an idea of some of the uh, pulling together of the visuals. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here as well um, and share with you our work and our um, passion for the science and the art of communicating uh, climate change. So the first film, I have three films for you. Um, the first one is called Relevance, and we made this film in 2016. Um, it was quite clear to us by then the climate was changing even faster than scientists had anticipated. Um, and that the changes really had deep implications for the entire planet. So this first film is a general one about uh, climate change in the Arctic. Um, and uh, it's, I think seven minutes long, so. Oh, no, that's not the one I wanted to share with you just yet. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. There we go. This is the one. Can you see that? Yes. Looking good. What is change? Is it environmental, social? Political? What is the Arctic? Is it just a large block of melting ice? When will the Arctic be inhabited? Do you really notice change? These are but a few of the questions from around the world that the Arctic Arts team of visual communicators hears each day. I'm not sure whether we are more surprised by the questions or whether those asking the questions are more surprised at our answers. One thing for sure, change is constant and it is very, very visual. But probably the biggest question that we consistently hear and the one that drives this team the most I don't live anywhere near the Arctic, so how can climate change be relevant to me? And why does it even matter? 
When asked this question, I think of a quote from the Scottish American naturalist and explorer, John Muir. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Muir's words are affirmed by the work at our project's core. As first-hand witnesses, we have seen that there is no single cause of climate change. Rather, that change is shared in the complexity of relevant scientific and visual cues that reach well beyond the Arctic. The Arctic's indigenous cultures aren't the only ones affected, and the issues are not limited by geographical boundaries. They are, however, potential roadmaps to the future of human existence. And that is indeed relevance. The Arctic is warming twice as quickly as the global average, a phenomenon known as Arctic amplification. This summer, our team experienced firsthand what we are calling the melt. With average high temperatures in Scoresby Sun Greenland at a record 8.7 degrees for August, the normal being 3.2, our groups played witness to some of the most dramatic melting ice visuals ever recorded. There was a calculated 1 trillion metric tons of melt in Greenland from 2013 to 15. And 2016 is on pace to have the largest melt ever. An estimated 450 billion metric tons of freshwater melt in one year. So how do we communicate change? Through diverse omni-channel guest experiences that create compelling storylines across multiple devices and channels, we can communicate the relevance of science to the world at large. Using documentary style visuals that don't just push information outward, but instead transport the viewer to the Arctic, allowing them to experience change as never before possible. So how do we transport the viewer to the Arctic? Through emerging experiential tools such as 360 panoramic video, virtual reality, real-time social media experiences, and 4D travel immersion, we will be able to educate and inspire through borderless venues of communication. As the human existence is wrapped in questions both profound and complex regarding this change, our team of communicators is faced with the challenge of bringing about global awareness through the visual. We look to evoke reason and empathetic dialogue between the scientific, artistic, and educational communities and bring perspective on the real and present kinetic evidence that exists in the Arctic. By merging experiential imagery from all segments, we hope to generate understanding and reflection to the world at large as to what change in the Arctic really looks like and how it becomes relevant to their own existence. No, the Arctic is not just a melting ice cube, rather a dramatic transition to a new landscape. With the decline of the ice caps, science has seen dramatic evidence that indicates that with the melt comes greater seismic, geothermal, and volcanic activity as evidenced in Siberia, Iceland, and even Chile in the Southern Hemisphere. The Arctic region has three main types of evolving vegetation, polar deserts in the north, boreal forest in the south, and tundra in between. Rising temperatures are activating a northward expansion of the boreal forest into the permafrost-laden tundra, and the tundra into the polar desert. Arctic life forms rely on the sea's biological productivity and on the presence of sea ice. Thousands of years of evolution have prepared Arctic species like the polar bear, walrus, and narwhal for life on and around the sea ice. But because of climate change, that ice cover has been changing rapidly in both extent and thickness and shrinking far too quickly for these species to adapt. Changes in the species' habitats 
availability, and unpredictable ice conditions are making the indigenous feel like strangers in their own land. Yes, we are all ice-dependent species. Societal changes within the Arctic's indigenous have increased their vulnerability to climate-induced changes, making their ability to adapt to changing climatic conditions greatly reduced, a trend that is reflected throughout the indigenous communities of the world, and not just the Arctic. Science is the powerful core to what we communicate. It establishes relevance to the visuals and provides structure to the team's mission. By focusing on both the diversity and complexity of change in the Arctic, we hope to inspire and educate the viewer. And through our existing and emerging channels of visual literacy, motivate the world at large to reflect on their own relevance to climate change. Once again, in the words of John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Change. As humans, we don't like it. We fear it. We avoid it. So we either take the science and bring it together through the visual communication channels that allow us to see things differently or we fall further behind. Arctic matters are real and present, and change is relevant to us all. So this next series. Uh, Andrea, uh, let yeah, me just yeah. say be, before you show anything else, um, yeah. you if you when you share your screen, you need to hit optimize sound and video because the sound and video was all out of sync and you couldn't really hear the music. Okay, did you do that? So I don't think go. you did that. There we go. Did you see it? No, did you I see didn't. It? Now I'm doing it. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted you all to know that it didn't, it really doesn't sound like uh, Carrie's talking in a tin can. It's really. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. It, it, it doesn't do justice. If I slow to that it. again. Um, did, you, did you see, do you see that button? Yeah, yeah, um, I got it. I got it now. Um, unfortunately, this next piece uh, is actually just a clip that has been used in a, a few different places, but I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, this is also from 2016. Try to deliver them this slate of electors, but he also contends that does that not sound? The genesis of this push. Somebody's got something going on in the background. Can you mute yourself? Can everybody mute? No, somebody's got something going on. Says that he had no involvement. How do we get some? He's having a conversation in the background. Why don't you? Yeah, we need to get everybody talk? muted. Office who rejected okay. John, can you? There we go. Okay. No. Somebody is still. Well, should I just go ahead? Can you guys hear no, me? Okay. No, we need to mute that. I think the co-host can mute all the participants in the yeah, participants yeah. panel. John, can you do that, or Michael? My chief staff do the right thing. I just did that. Where's Where's Michael? Okay. And I just unmuted myself, so I think we're good. Okay. Okay. Great. I'm sorry, you guys. No worries. Okay. So this next uh, piece is just about one minute long. Uh, we titled it "Reverse" um, because it's actually it's extraordinary uh, to watch the ice essentially returning. It has an inspiring feeling to it. Um, so you first see it fall and then you see it go back on, um, which is basically what we wanna do, right? We wanna reverse changing climate. Um, this was filmed in 2016 also uh, at a glacier in Western Greenland called Eki Glacier. And 
We were there for eight days. And during that short time, Eki, which is not a big glacier, lost uh, more than 2 million metric tons of ice. It was just constantly calving. Uh, we could hear it all day and uh, often in the night even, which is also unusual. Um, and uh, we got at what was at the time, uh, the first time uh, footage had been done uh, right above the glacier with the drones. So you could really, really see what it was like when it fell, uh, which was really cool for us. Um, but it gives you an idea of this small glacier could lose that much ice. Um, Okay, so the next thing, I'm gonna take it off share for just one second because I'm gonna talk for a moment. Um, the, next, the next thing I'm gonna share with you is from 2019. So in the early spring of 2019, around March, climatologist Jason Box came out with a critical meta study that was about all the changes brought by warming climate to the Arctic systems. Um, we immediately realized how important the study was, and we went to Greenland just a couple of months later in May to document um, the different pieces that Jason was talking about in this study. Uh, in later, May. document um, the different pieces that Jason was talking about. Oh, I'm echoing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we did realize later that the record temperatures that we witnessed during our time there uh, signaled a, trip, a tipping point for Greenland, uh, where the ice loss from the summer exceeded the amount of ice that was accumulated during the winter, essentially uh, creating a decline from then on in the amount of ice on the Greenland ice sheet and its glaciers. Um, which means it's raising sea levels. Um, and then we were invited to Brussels just a couple months after that to present to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They wanted to see uh, what we had seen, which was this documentation, a visual documentation directly uh, from the science. And so uh, the thing I'm gonna play for you now is actually just um, a recording of the presentation, part of the presentation and the visuals that we brought to the IUCN uh, that summer in Brussels, which gives you a, a good idea of the, um, the way that we really interpret the science and, and share it quite directly. In April of this year, climatologist Jason Box released a meta-study spanning 47 years of data in nine key aspects of the Arctic system that have been altered by climate change. Many of the changes documented in the study were particularly visible in the spring, so our group left in May to document what is happening there. We spent two weeks in Western Greenland taking photographs and video what we experienced was one of the warmest springs on record for the region. Spring came four weeks early this year, and these temperatures had precisely the effect documented in the box study. In our explorations of the tundra areas, we found no snow remaining where normally there would still be light coverage and low temperatures, keeping the plants dormant. Instead, the tundra surface was covered in water-filled bogs. Plants were coming to life, many of them blooming already, but there were almost no insects yet. The effect of this is multifold. The longer growing season increases the biomass of plants in areas where there is water. There is an increase in CO2 uptake with this. However, the degradation of these plants in autumn increases the CO2 output and results in an increase in CO2 release overall. The bogs allow ancient carbon dioxide and methane to bubble to the surface, which we were able to see in many areas. The unusual warmth also has the result of a shorter bloom cycle and a mismatch between the plant's need for pollination and the arrival of the insects that do this work. Long term, this will result in far fewer species of plants in the tundra and a limited diet for animals like caribou and musk oxen that depend on them for food and this is happening in many areas of the Arctic. The next observation we made was that the sea ice was vastly reduced from its normal coverage in the area. Weeks ahead of the usual time, the fishermen were out in boats, 
laying long lines to catch halibut. The fishermen have observed that the halibut have grown smaller in recent years. This is likely due to overfishing. Rather than a small number of fish being caught in the springtime, thousands of tons are pulled from the water as the longline fishing from boats is a far more effective way to catch fish than through the ice. The more time that the sea is free of ice, the more fish are caught here, at least until overfishing reduces the available catch. The Greenlandic fishermen we talked to were happy about this. They make more money to buy things like bigger boats, snowmobiles, and televisions. They can buy food in the winter, and so are less concerned with the loss of caribou and musk oxen than people in more remote parts of the Arctic who depend on these animals for food all winter. On Disco Island, the story is somewhat different. The halibut population has declined there, but the men are catching far more cod. Cod have moved north as the waters have warmed. This is a temporary bounty, as the waters can become too warm for the fish eggs to incubate properly, meaning that the cod population is possibly moving north rather than simply expanding their territory northward. The early melt of the sea ice also causes changes in whale migration patterns by allowing them to migrate north earlier in the ice-free ocean. Morton Rash, head of the Arctic Research Station on Disco Island, speaks of a time when people would travel by dog sled all winter to the mainland of Greenland for supplies. The sea ice has become too thin and unpredictable to do this for two decades. The average temperature in the cold season is up 3.1 degrees Celsius. The Arctic is warming much more than the rest of the planet due to polar amplification a phenomenon where the poles are subject to a greater rise in temperature than the rest of the planet. Because it is so warm, the ice is not as thick, and multi-year ice in the very north is disappearing, leaving the sea covered with only a thinner, darker layer of first-year ice. Supplies must be brought in by helicopter all winter to Disco Island until the ice melts sufficiently that travel by boat is possible. We watched the last of the sea ice disappear in Disco Bay as the temperature skyrocketed during our stay. The last area we documented was the Great Ice Sheet on the western side. We are all aware of the melting of the ice sheet, but it is another thing to see it happening. We flew north from Alulisat to Eki Glacier. Our last visit to Eki, 20 months before, had us curious about how the glacier had changed in this time. The glacier has not receded noticeably, but it has deflated markedly, leaving much more rock exposed along the cliffs that flank it. As we flew over Eki and up to the ice sheet, there were tracks and pools of deep blue water all over the surface of the glacier. The ice sheet, which should still be white, was similarly traced with blue. Every crack and crevice held a river, every depression, a lake. It is beautiful and really frightening to see so much blue water up there in May. Blue absorbs much more of the sun's radiation, which then causes more melt with that heat. Albedo refers to a surface's ability to reflect solar radiation. When a surface is no longer white, the lower albedo allows more heat to be absorbed, creating a feedback loop that dramatically increases the amount of water running from the ice sheet and into the oceans. Scientists are beginning to understand how this freshwater runoff affects ocean currents and therefore winds and weather all over the planet. The Arctic is the key that unlocks our way of life here on Earth. If we allow this vulnerable system to fail, we set forth a cascade of changes everywhere. It could all be seen as simply depressing, making us want to turn away from what the Arctic is telling us. But I see this message as a gift. In the Arctic, we are able to see firsthand how deeply a place can be altered by a warmer climate. The Arctic is a sentinel, telling us to move quickly, to change the way we function on this planet, to change the way we see this planet. It is not a thing with endless resources for us to squander. 
It is a living system made up of countless smaller living systems working together to create this beautiful, habitable place. Okay, you guys, I'm going to stop that one there and because we're going to run out of time. So I want to turn it back over to Carrie quickly um, so that we can cover everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was great. Uh, the technical worked beautiful on that Sorry. one. So <laughs> okay. we, have, we, we still have 20 minutes. So, okay. So okay. one of the things that Andrea is bringing to light in that key indicator study was the relation between the deep science and what we saw, and then the relevance to the rest of the planet. And I want to just get Bruce's input on how the Arctic changes that we see and that you have seen really affect the rest of the world and the mechanisms therein. So why don't you give us a little bit of insight on the science of that? Sure. Thanks, Kerry. I'm going to... Um bring up a couple examples, but I first want to tag back to your quoting of John Muir. hundred years ago, he had it right. It's all connected. The more we learn, it is all connected. You pull on that one thread and um, it's all one. So one of the ways you can think about this is um, of the solar radiation reaching the earth. Think of the sea ice in the Arctic as kind of earth sombrero. It's protecting us from the more intense heat that we would receive through a thinner atmosphere at the poles. And we, as that melts, we get a little darker uh, surface, as uh, Andrea pointed out in the video, that absorbs more heat, more warming, and you kind of get this runaway effect. And um, this is also coupled with the ocean. And Andrea, I think you have a visual for the conveyor. I do. I have the, that up. To give you this guy. Yeah, Wally Broker created this several decades ago, but he figured out how the oceans worked. And... Um, it's kind of complicated, but just focus on the different, the orange and the blue, um, whereas the warm surface currents are in orange. And uh, as they travel along the surface, they head up towards Greenland and Svalbard. Um, they, they cool down and there's a salinity component. The water uh, basically yeah. sinks in a deep water and it drives this sort of circulation uh, that transfers heat throughout our oceans. And this is coupled with the climate and this is what drives our weather. And another example is how the temperature difference between the equator and the North Pole is what drives the, uh, the jet stream that brings weather systems from west to east. Well, as that gradient, as, a, as the Arctic warms, that gradient reduces, the energy of that jet stream is reduced. And so think of it as like a wavering flag rather than just being driven straight downwind, it can now kind of meander in a sort of a, like a river or a flag does. And what that allows for is persistence. So what happens is you get a, a, a weather system that brings moisture or uh, heat or drought or whatever, it can just park over a place for a long period of time. Witness in Colorado, the 2013 floods, we had a year's worth of precipitation in three days because a system just came and parked. So this is a, basically a perturbation and um, poking of climate that will uh, uh, give rise to extreme climate events, whether they're uh, wildfires in the West. We've seen dramatic changes in fire behavior that are uh, a new regime for um, how we interact with the forest in the Western United States is, is uh, dramatic and we're, we're witnessing it every, every summer. As a volunteer firefighter, I see that firsthand. Um, but, there is one thing I, I, I will point out that, that does give me hope. And that is uh, in a university, I'm privy to interacting with a lot of young, bright, very motivated students who are going to inher inherit this problem much more than I. And it's their resilience and their willingness to tackle these challenges that gives me hope because uh, the earth's gonna do just fine. It's all the species on it they're going to need to adapt and we're going to have to get very creative and i have great hope in the next generation yeah thanks bruce and you know one of the things that arctic arts has really focused on over the last few years is a component of hope in all of our films um, trying to bring to light how people can be involved how they can take action um, and, and really that's the important part i mean it's very easy to get overwhelmed by what we see, the science we see, 
Um, and really that keeps us going is to have a hope component to all of this. Um, I wanna share real quickly our website um, because we have an action page and everybody can go there. Uh, okay. Yeah. For some reason. There you go. Yeah. My favorite um, photo. <laughs> Carrie yeah, but doesn't, not... but Carrie doesn't brag, but that photo has won so many awards around the world, and you can see why. I'm going to have to stop sharing, though. It's not giving me. What are you wanting to share? I'm going to show the, the website. You want to pull up the website, Andrea? It's not letting sure. me share the website, and I want to go to the action page and really talk can about you... the components therein. If we can get that. I'll get it. So while she's bringing that up, you know, I'll, I'll talk about just my personal journey, because one of the things that we have found is it's really important for people to take ownership of their own changes. Uh, change can be frightening. Change can be a little overwhelming. And you, you think, no, I, I don't have any impact on the global aspect of things, um, but I can do that individually. And if we take just your own world, what can you do? And we've talked about, you know, years ago, it was like change a light bulb. Well, we've gone quite a ways past changing the light bulbs um, because there's a lot greater issues. But if we take on our transportation issues, you know, by electric, walk, Bruce talks about riding a bike, um, where's our transportation come from and how do we reduce our footprint by those actions. Food, food, we waste 40% of the food in the world, and most of it is, happens in North America, this food waste. Um, mm. Reduce your red meat, reduce your food waste, reduce the things that you purchase that come from the other side of the world. You know, let's just pare down what you're doing as an individual. And then commit to avoiding plastic, single plastic, single use plastics. But then the next step is communicate to your community, project. your friends, your neighbors. How do we make a difference if we don't even communicate to our neighbors and our friends? Inspire them. The next is take it to the bigger picture. You know, communicate to businesses, to policymakers, what you're doing. Vote. But vote to an active change. Um, so again, as individuals, one at a time, we don't make a difference. But if we realize that we're all connected and we start making much gr greater choices from the business side of things, from our buying choices, from the governmental side of things, we can take great action. So go to the website. There's some really great resources on the website in terms of measuring your carbon footprint, changing your habits, uh, where does local food come from? Uh, so some real good action items there, but embrace it with hope. There's, there's hope in the things that are happening. So. I, Carrie, I also want to say to everyone that the website is full of absolutely the most jaw-dropping, gorgeous photography and lots of videos that are available for you to watch, both short and longer ones. So please take a journey across the website when you have a chance. Go ahead. Yeah, Andrea, personal hopes and motivations for you? Well, as you mentioned, as a as a parent, I very much want a planet that at least resembles the one that I grew up on for my daughter. Um, and I I feel like we have such an obligation to leave this planet in much better shape than it looks like we're going to for coming generations. So my my deepest motivations come from that sense of responsibility and that 
that sense of um, hope that most people feel that way. I mean, I, I think a lot of people feel that way about their children and their grandchildren. And um, we, don't, we don't want to leave them a mess. So my hope really comes um, with that feeling that we can garner that, that yes. sense for our future generations and, uh, and, and give them something fabulous and beautiful like we've had. <laughs> yes. We need to show them that we love them. Yes. Yeah. Are, are, are we going to show, talk about the expedition coming up? Yeah. Um, so one of the projects we've got in the works right now um, <clears throat> there's a little archipelago that we showed on the map at one point called Svalbard. And it's an archipelago north of Norway, um, small little cluster of islands between the North Pole and Norway. And it is warming seven times greater than the rest of the planet. And part of what Bruce was talking about in that conveyor belt, you saw where the heat was gathering and the currents uh, going across Svalbard and the Barents Sea are warming dramatically. Um, this is affecting the rest of the planet. It's not just um, a, 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 an element that stays within the Arctic. It reaches uh, through those currents and warming waters, the coast of Africa. Uh, it reaches the lower equatorial Atlantic. And what happens is that affects weather patterns, jet streams, ocean currents, uh, around the planet, and thus we get more hurricanes in the North American region, um, all coming off of what little archipelago is happening up in Svalbard. So we've got a film, and Andrea is going to cue it up. Um, we're calling it Canary. Are, are you going to talk about a little bit more about that expedition? What you, the other two that you've done after the trailer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a trailer um, highlighting the two expeditions that we've done so far. And we have another one in September that will highlight um, some amazing captured footage that we have, in fact, never before seen footage um, of reactive behaviors, behavioral changes within uh, animals within the archipelago. Um, but we'll get it back by science before we deliver the product, but amazing stuff. And we'll talk a little bit more. Go ahead. Andrea. Yeah, I'll just, yeah. I'll just play this. Uh, and then you can optimize. Sound. Got... It's optimized. It's optimized. <laughs> The Arctic is changing. Svalbard, a small archipelago of islands deep in the Arctic, is changing faster than anywhere else on Earth. survive as the world shifts around them. Join the Arctic Arts Project team on Svalbard. Experience what this canary in a coal mine can reveal about the future of our climate and our planet. All right, um, so very excited to share with the rest of the world uh, what's going on in Svalbard. Uh, it's such a, obviously a canary, uh, a canary in the coal mine representing a, a very dramatic sentinel of what's happening and what is happening around the world, not just in this archipelago, but uh, we've been given a gift to understand 
visually what's happening and then we'll bring it to the rest of the world. Uh, hopefully early winter, we'll have the complete film ready to go. So Andrea, okay. any other and thoughts on Svalbard? Well, just that you've had two other expeditions and the, the reindeer uh, footage, I'd love for you to make a mention of what they just saw and why that was so historic because that's just a tiny little piece that gives him a, that alludes to a much bigger question that's still unresolved. And our team captured this footage that no one else on the planet had captured previously. This is what they do. So, yeah, well, I can talk briefly about that. Um, there has been, um, we, what we captured was actually a, a polar bear hunting reindeer. Polar bear are uh, completely adapted to a marine diet. So that means seals and walrus and things like that. Their bodies are optimized to pull nutrition from the, the blubber and um, they do it super quickly. They can metabolize it really quickly and really well. Um, so um, pursuing a meat source that is very high in protein, but very low in fat, like the reindeer is an unusual um, behavior to see on a larger scale. And so this, um, this idea that the, the polar bear are learning because they, the mamas teach their babies to hunt this way, um, they're learning to pursue other uh, food sources, eggs, birds. Unfortunately, Svalbard doesn't have a lot of people, 2,500 people, but also uh, human um, refuse and so forth. Um, so the bears, the bears are very good at uh, finding food, um, but this creates some very interesting questions for the future about uh, the health of the bears, the, um, the populations of reindeer and so forth, and uh, you know, how that plays out will be, will be very interesting over time. They have the entire footage. This is just a, to a snippet of it, but uh, they have the entire footage of the chase and the capture, which I guess is rather painful. But, you know, from BBC to Disney to Netflix, they all want it because it's a historic first and challenges uh, what science has known up until this point. Dennis? Is it possible for a, a viewer to chime in now? Uh, well, there will be in just a minute. Well, I'll call on questions. So uh, please. Well, well, Janice, hold on. Yeah, and it's great. is it? Okay. Let me explain. Here's the thing. So you, you guys want to keep this conversation going, right? So you can, but we need to stop the live stream. So Okay. We got two minutes, time. right? Two minutes. You do you for do. them so, to wrap and, up. Well, welcome. We want first. I just want to say how impressive this is and important this is. I just want to underscore the the challenge it is to get people's attention and the need to communicate in compelling ways. I think you're very wise, Bruce, to do this kind of partnership. This is what we need to see. Um, and of course, how we're going to deal with multiple challenges in the world right now, right? At the same time, this is definitely our our challenge. So yes, let's. In a minute or so, we're going to stop the stream. I'll wait for right. you to say Janice when you want to, but then we can keep the conversation going for about another yeah. three minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, we're wrapping up here, and then I'll do a short wrap uh, in the next two minutes or so. You guys, I'll. Yeah, it even... needs to be the to stop the stream. That's what I'm saying. Right. Do we have two minutes? We have one minute. One minute. Oh, go Why for don't it. You can yeah. wrap up, Janice, and then we can take it off. Well, screen. all I want to say is that you can see what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. And we need to support this work because in all my work with um, visual literacy of, around science, I have not seen this kind of quality and connection between the arts and the sciences that drives knowledge and the heart. So that's it. Anything else, you guys? We've got one minute. Thank nope. you for Very having cool. us. Thank you for the forum.